Good morning. So this is our candle lighting liturgy. So over 100 people from the ages of 2 to 80 years old were asked the question, what gives you hope? So from the voices of different generations, hear their answers. An adult might say, my two-year-old son. The child may say, dogs wagging their tails. The older adult said, talking with young people. The teenager said, kindness from strangers. The adult, spending time in the woods. The child, waffles. The older adult, hands clasped in prayer. The teenager, social progress. The adult, the way my son calls everybody buddy. <laughs> the child said the, ch the ringing of church bells. The older adult said, Babies trying over and over to take their first step. The teenager, the turning of seasons. The adult, Christian community. The child, books. The older adult, friendship with my adult children. The teenager, advocates for justice. The adult, hearing children in the pews sing the hymns. The child, the sunrise every single morning. The older adult, what gives you hope? Today, we light the candle of hope to remind ourselves that God is at work in this world. From generation to generation, God has brought good news of love and compassion, justice and community. Let us rest and abide in that good news. Amen. Now we'll have our, our call to confession. In God's house, everyone is welcome. Those who seem like they have had it all together and those who feel like their world is falling apart. No matter who we are, there's room for us here. With that confidence, we turn to God in prayer, speaking the truth of our lives. Let us pray. God of today and God of tomorrow, you say, bring your full self. There's room for you here. But we say, our lives are too messy. You say, bring your hopes and your dreams. There's room for you here. But we say it's too risky to hope. You say, bring your grief and your prayers. There's room for you here. But we say some things are easier to forget. God of today and God of tomorrow, we know in our hearts that there's room for us here. Forgive us for withholding our full selves from you. Forgive us for giving only our Sunday best. Help us remember today and tomorrow. There's room for every story. Amen. Words of forgiveness. Family of faith. We who feel scattered are held together. We who have lost our way are forgiven and found, and we who are lonely are brought into the fold and are told there's room for you here. From generation to generation, this is the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are held, forgiven, found, and welcomed. Thanks be to God. Amen.
morning's scripture reading, Hebrew scripture reading is from Isaiah 2, 1 through 5, God's kingdom to triumph. The word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, and it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. O house of Jacob, come ye and let us walk in the light of the Lord. for the prayer of thanksgiving, please pray, please pray with me. Dear Father God, I thank you that I have the Holy Spirit to guide me in, in expressing who you are in my life. Sweet, blessed Jesus, in everything I do, may the fruits of the Spirit be evident. Help us to continue to obey you from the heart and grow by the sanctifying power of your word. Help us to strive after godliness for the purpose of honoring you in all things. In Jesus' precious, holy, faithful, and thankful name, we praise you always. Amen.
on this first Sunday of Advent, there is a yearning, a yearning that keeps us moving forward to what God has for us. Before we move into our uh, prayer for illumination and declaration of faith, last Sunday, we talked about Christ the King. And I really wanted to share with you at that time what some children think a a king looks like. And so I went to the preschool and I uh, I asked the director and said, could the children draw me a picture or pictures of a king? And she said, when do you want it? I said, tomorrow. (laughs) She said, okay. And she had it ready, but I wasn't able to pick it up from her. And this is what the children of the preschool think a king looks like. And it's up there, too. Yes, the king does look very much like a woman. Good stuff! (laughs) And each of the children identified their part in that. So there you have it. What does a child think a king looks like? Not like the king that we talked about last week. But you know what? That's pretty cool. So I wanted you to see it. And now let us pray that God would illuminate the word in scripture and that we may be prepared to hear what God is telling us. God of the ages, in scripture, we hear stories of people like us, ordinary people, people who longed to know you, people who longed to follow you, people who made mistakes, people who tried to grow, old, young, native, immigrant, new to the faith, lifelong believer, In scripture, we hear stories of people like this. So just as you walked with them, help us to hear and remember all the ways that you walk with us. We're listening. We're grateful. We are yours. Amen. Now, let us together affirm our faith, which will be on the screen. We believe in a God who promised to Abraham, who wrestled with Jacob, who walked with Ruth, who spoke with Moses, who grieved with Bathsheba, who danced with David, who hoped like Mary. We believe in a God who has been loving, inviting, transforming and challenging us from generation to generation. And we believe that same God is here with us now saying, come on in, there's room for you here. Amen. From generation to generation, that's the theme for our Advent season this year. Our God remains the same from generation to generation. Our understanding of our God frequently goes through changes. Before I read the scripture this morning, I want you to think just for a moment about your parents, your grandparents, and perhaps some others who've come before you. For some of you, this will bring back good memories. And I recognize that for some of you, the memories may be painful. Because that's the way life is. Perhaps there are skeletons hiding in your family tree. Or even tremendous surprises. Since Francis Collins and the Human Genome Project, millions of people 
have made discoveries about their families and their histories through companies like 23andMe. <laughs> have any of you had that kind of genomic testing to find out just what, your, what some of those roots are like? <laughs> Were there surprises? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Sometimes the surprises are dramatic. Sometimes they're even life-changing for people who receive them. And I see Karen is very much in agreement. I will not ask you to bring your skeletons out right now. <laughs> okay, not bad, all right. Every one of us would have found some surprises if we were to take that step, without a doubt. Some of the discoveries people have made have been exciting and beautiful. Others have been heartbreaking and caused people to actually question who they are. Having a sense of our past is important because the roots of our being draw life from our ancestors and from those who raised us, which may be the same and may not be. In fact, even if we know nothing about our genetic background, that history impacts us, our stories, and our roots. I want you to invite you to think about your roots as we read this scripture this morning. It's going to be a little bit different. We don't usually read this particular text in public. Only the first verse, I believe, is going to be on the screen. But I want you to be thinking about your roots as we read about Jesus' roots. This is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac, the father of Jacob. Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez, the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of Abinadab. Abinadab, the father of Nashon. Nashon, the father of Solomon. Solomon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Solomon, the father of Rehoboam. Rehoboam, the father of Abijah. Abijah, the father of Asa. Asa, the father of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat, the father of Jehoram. Jehoram, the father of Uzziah. And Uzziah, the father of Jotham. Jotham was the father of Ahaz. Ahaz, the father of King Hezekiah. Hezekiah was the father of Manasseh. Manasseh, the father of Ammon. Ammon, the father of Josiah, and Josiah, the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. After the exile to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel. Shealtiel, the father of Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel, the father of Abihud. Abihud, the father of Eliakim. Eliakim, the father of Azor. Azor, the father of Zadok. Zadok, the father of Akim. Akim, the father of Elihud. Elihud, the father of Eleazar. Eleazar, the father of Matan. Matan, the father of Jacob. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. And Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. Now, there were 14 generations in all from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile in Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Messiah. And so the story begins. 
there's room for every story. Yeah, I know, that was a lot of names. For <laughs> I practiced. <laughs> I think what we learn from this passage is that our stories begin with our roots. They don't start at some random place. How many of you have a genealogy that goes back 42 generations that you can identify? <laughs> no. Oh, I'm so shocked. And, and, and we know that even these 42 generations that are identified in Matthew 1 are not complete. In other genealogies, there are other names that are inserted. These were people that were chosen, that were known. What I want you to think about, though, is the fact that each of these names had a story. We know a little bit about some of the stories, but others of the stories, we know nothing. They're completely lost to us. However, not knowing the story does not mean that the story did not matter. They all mattered. Each story is the part, as a part of the end which Matthew identifies as Jesus, the one who is called Messiah. Interestingly, there is a very unusual move in this list of genealogy. Quite frankly, only men counted. It didn't matter. The men mattered. Fortunately, we live in a world where that is no longer the case. But in this genealogy, there are five women mentioned. Now today, when we put together a family tree, mother's names are almost always included in that family tree. But 3,000 years ago, mothers were the property of their husbands or their family and they were no sooner identified than the cattle or sheep that the husband or family owned. So five women, who were they? Well, one was a woman named Tamar, the daughter-in-law of Jacob, who had been married to a son of Jacob that died without children, whose brother died without children upon marrying her, and Jacob, who would not give his third son to Tamar to have children. And so Tamar posed as a prostitute at a temple shrine and Jacob conceived his grandchildren in that act. That's Tamar. She's later identified as among the righteous and included in Jesus' genealogy. One of the other women mentioned was Rahab, the resident of Jericho who hid the Israelite spies when they were exploring the land they would soon attack. Rahab, Rahab has been known throughout history as a harlot. And yet Rahab is included in the hall of faith in Hebrews 11, included in Jesus' own genealogy. The third woman was, that was mentioned was, the widow, was a widow from Moab. Her name was Ruth. She left her homeland with her mother-in-law with words of love to her mother-in-law 
that have become part of many wedding ceremonies. Ruth later went to a harvest festival, seduced her close relative, and became his wife. And she had a, da- had a son. And after that came Uriah's wife, otherwise known as Bathsheba, the woman King David impregnated and then tried to hide by murdering her husband and marrying her. And finally we hear about Mary, a woman who before she and Joseph came together was found to be with child. These are not random women that were chosen. These are women who experienced dramatic trauma. Think of their lives. The circumstances that traumatized them, which impacted their children generation after generation after generation. In fact, in the Law of Moses, it says that if a child is born out of wedlock, Neither that child nor seven generations are permitted to gather in worship. Talk about trauma. My goodness, what these women went through. But I imagine some of you know exactly what they went through. You understand their trauma. You've lost a spouse. You were abused by someone you trusted. Perhaps your reputation was destroyed by false rumors. And the trauma of those events rests with you and continues to impact your relationships even many years and perhaps generations later. But here's the good news. Even these traumatic events can be transformed by the grace of God. Earlier, Angie read our Hebrew scripture from Isaiah chapter 2. In that passage, As Isaiah was beginning his ministry, he looked forward to a day of peace. A day when people from all over the world and from every background would gather at God's house. A day when they would celebrate on God's mountain. He looked to a day when everyone would understand God's ways and God's law. And then he looked to a day when weapons of war will no longer be needed and will in fact be transformed into instruments of peace. Swords will become plows to break up the hard soil. Spears will be used to prune dead branches from trees. Isaiah's looking for a day when the anguish of violence will be enfolded into the joy of harvest. And that's the way God brings transformation. Our stories today are filled with traumatic events. People all around our country live in fear. Last weekend, a safe place for the LGBTQ community in Colorado Springs, we all know now, became a place of trauma and death when a gunman opened fire in Club Q. On Tuesday, the Walmart in Virginia became the latest shooting site, killing six. Our children in elementary school are not only taught how to deal with a fire alarm, but they're also given lockdown drills and active shooter drills. The FBI reports that in 2017, 
a murder occurred in this country every 30 minutes. And a rape was carried out every four minutes. Whether we realize it or not, none of our stories are untouched by this reality. It's part of who we are. Just as Jesus' story was impacted by the violence and tyranny of Rome, from infancy, when he and his family had to flee to Egypt, so our stories are shaped by the trauma we experience today. We need the healing that God provides, healing that will enfold all that pain in the joy of harvest. Tell me your story. I love to ask that question. And very frequently, the answer is, well, where should I begin? And I'll usually answer, you begin where you want me to know, what you want me to know. You start wherever you wish. And so sometimes I hear about childhood. Sometimes I hear about meeting a spouse. Sometimes I hear about how a person got into the job that they're in. Sometimes their story begins with their ancestors. Well, my family was part of the, were, were, past, uh, were passengers on the Mayflower. I, I once read a children's book that talked about your story, child, and that the story of you began with the Big Bang. That would have been a long story, wouldn't it? But it's true. Everything that has happened to us to this point, in fact, everything that has happened is part of who you and I are. As we move forward as one people, connected by experience, we're part of a global family. Our stories, like Jesus' story, is not just about us. But there's room for all of our stories as well. It's a journey that can move us from trauma to healing, from violence to peacemaking, from loneliness to community, from brokenness to salvation. Many of our experiences leave us feeling like we have no way to care for ourselves, except with the weapons of personal warfare that we've learned through our pain, the weapons of passive aggressive behavior, the weapons of lashing out at, one, at those who are around us, the weapons of revenge, and payback of violence in word and action, they're weapons of war that God longs to transform in our lives. Shane Claiborne lives in Kensington. The name may sound familiar to many of you. He was not raised in Kensington. Rather, after graduating from Eastern, he chose to live in Kensington because he believes faith can best be expressed in a community that's in turmoil. In the years that Shane has lived there and worked in Kensington, hundreds have died on the streets from gun violence and from overdoses. But because he deeply loves the people in his neighborhood, he has brought the stories of those people into his own being. He weeps with those who weep. And when people die in his neighborhood, he becomes ever more determined to make a difference. Recently, Shane opened a store in Kensington. Now, if you're an entrepreneur, that probably isn't where you're going to open your store, is it? That's where Shane opened it. It's a store that sells garden tools, 
jewelry, and nameplates. Huh? Every piece in everything that he sells is made from guns that have been decommissioned and repurposed. The name of his business is Raw Tools. Why? That seems like a strange name too. But Raw Tools is reversing tools of war into tools for peace. Shane is taking Isaiah's words literally and beating guns into garden tools. Within the Raw Tools store, there's a room dedicated to the memory of those who've been lost to violence in the city of Philadelphia. The store's just opened in the last month, and already that room is almost filled with names and pictures of those who've been lost. The mission of Raw Tools is to disarm hearts, forge peace, and cultivate justice. Raw Tools is an example of letting the stories of the people around us transform our lives. It's a picture of regeneration of, as tools of violence become tools of life. The regeneration work grows out of the stories from the street. So I need to ask you, are there some weapons that are part of your life that you've been hanging on to? Are there people you'd like to remove from your story? Pretend they're not even there. What do you long for God to transform in your life? You see, no matter what your story is, God can use that story in the bigger story of salvation. Judah, the father of the tribe from which Jesus came, fathered his own grandchildren through his daughter-in-law. David murdered his lover's husband. And each of the, these names in this genealogy list had stories just like this. And here's the good news. God used them right where they were with all those things that don't seem to fit. God used them to accomplish the work of salvation. You see, there's room in God's plan for your story. No matter what that story is, when we entrust that story to God, God will use it to demonstrate the power of redemption. <laughs> you know what? Most of us are a whole lot more deadly than any gun that's out there. Just by the way we relate to the people that we're not sure about. And those are the weapons that God wants to transform into weapons of peace. God will turn our personal weapons of war into implements of growth. Join with me now in prayer. Heavenly Father, we have so many things in our lives that are far from where you want us to be. And yet, as children have expressed what a king is in their own way, you are expressing to us your love in ways that only we as individuals can hear. Thank you for the transforming power of Jesus. And may we permit our story to be remade in 
with Jesus' hands. For it is in his name that we pray. Amen. We're going to be led now by the praise band in the song, All the World Relates, Hosanna. You know what, if you've got, what's that? Awaits. Okay. <laughs> and if God is working in your heart right now, and there are things that you need to take care of, some business with God, or perhaps the need to share, uh, become part of this congregation, you're invited to come as we sing this song of welcome and invitation. All the world relates. Let's stand together as we sing.
All right, now we're going to wrap this up with prayers of the people. God of Abraham and Isaac, God of Tamar and Ruth, God of Mary and Joseph, we bow our heads today, hoping to catch a glimpse or a shimmer of you. We know that you are here with us, just as you walked with every generation before. So we bring you our prayers. Thank you for creating space for us. Thank you for seeing our scattered thoughts, our imposter syndrome, our fragments of doubt, and still saying, come on in. Thank you for seeing our ordinary selves with anxious concerns and unflattering habits and saying, I have bigger plans for you. Thank you for seeing our fragile egos and our uncertain relationships and saying, you still belong here. Your expansive love makes room for us to breathe and we want to love with our lungs and hearts full. So today we pray, teach us how to make that same room for others. When we come face to face with stories that are different from ours, show us how to add chairs to the table. When we find ourselves face to face with stories that frustrate and test our patience, show us how to build bridges instead of walls. When we find ourselves face to face with stories that feel foreign or unrelatable, remind us to open the door and to listen fully. From Abraham to Mary, you made room for every story and that love continues to make room for us. Teach us to do the same for our neighbors so this world will know love. With hope we pray using the words your son taught us to say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Amen.
that God brings. May you find healing for your stories as you hear the stories of God. And may your life each day reflect the healing that God brings. Now go in peace. Oh.